Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President and CEO of the Massachusetts Technology Leadership Council, Tom Hopcroft. Well, good evening, everyone. We have a great mix of people here in the audience today from all over the world. But I want to take a moment to acknowledge some of the great tech success stories right here in Massachusetts, such as PTC, whose legacy as a CAD company has given way to its leadership with the Internet of Things. As the state's largest tech group, MassTLC is focused on accelerating innovation and growth. And we're fortunate to have been able to co-locate our annual IoT conference here with LiveWorks today. We spent the morning showcasing the tech ecosystem and the global thought leadership that has evolved in Massachusetts, built, of course, upon a 40-year legacy of data and things that makes this one of the best places in the world for IoT. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be part of this community during this exciting time as we contemplate the technological, business, and societal transformations that will accompany the instrumentation and automation of our physical world. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage three global IoT thought leaders who happen to also call Massachusetts their home. Colin Angle, Jim Heppelman, Colin and Professor Michael Porter. So sitting next to me is the co-founder, president, and CEO of iRobot Corporation, Mr. Colin Angle. He is one of the world's leading authorities on mobile robots and is reshaping his company to be a major player in the smart home. Next to Colin, our next panelist is the president and CEO of PTC, Jim Heppelman. Jim has won many industry awards for innovation and thought leadership around the IoT, and he too is reshaping his company to be a major player in the IoT ecosystem. Our final panelist needs little introduction. Widely recognized as the father of modern business strategy, he is the author of over 19 books and 125 articles. He is one of the world's most influential thinkers on management and competitiveness, and we are honored to have him with us here today, Harvard Business School Professor Michael Porter. Thank you. So let's get started. Michael, Jim, I wanted to start by talking about this, this research collaboration that you two have forged uh, around the whole regional cluster here and, and IoT generally. Um, Michael, do you want to start off and tell us a bit about this collaboration between an academic professor and an industry executive, kind of how that came about, and what are the benefits to approaching research in this way? Well, thank you. I'd be happy to, and, and welcome all of you to this incredible event. I'm, I'm just blown away. I, I just got here a few minutes ago, uh, and I hope it's been as stimulating to you as it's been to me uh, being here. Um, I, you know, I was, uh, have long worked in, in competition and strategy. I've worked across many industries, and I've written a lot about kind of the fundamentals of competition. And, um, you know, probably, you know, 20, 25 years ago, we started seeing information technology uh, start to embed itself into competition, into companies. And I, I wrote some articles on that uh, transformation. Um, uh, but it was kind of a matter of luck here that I happened to be a, a PTC board member for a number of years, and uh, I would sit in these board meetings and talk about you know, where, where the business was going, and what we started seeing was this phenomena starting to bubble up into, um, into the consciousness of, of, of a company that had been fundamentally focused on products and product design, and I was so intrigued by this and the impact that it could have on competition that uh, you know, I persuaded Jim to uh, work with me uh, as a co-author on a body of work, and of course, what we had was uh, we had an academic like me who's worked in this field for a long time, but 
you know, Jim is a, a, a Harvard level quality of mind and to work with a great engineer and an academic, I'm by the way an engineer just for the record, uh, and, uh, and then to have the access that we had through both HBS and our alumni but also to PTC and their client base, it was just a, it was a magical opportunity to take on something really complicated. So it's been a phenomenal process over the last four or five years. We have two articles that have already been published, probably a couple more in the pipeline. Uh, this is one of the most dramatic transformations in competition, certainly the most dramatic today of anything in, in the economy, but also I think if we, even if we look back 10 or 20 years, this is going to look like one of the biggest changes we've had to deal with. That's great. And, and maybe yeah. I could add, uh, it's very interesting, you know, as a CEO and as a technologist to actually get to engage uh, a mind like Michael, because uh, there's really two things that have happened. You know, number one, Michael has some incredible uh, time-proven uh, strategy frameworks, and, and we use those frequently as lenses to sort of, uh, you know, kind of collect the data we were getting from our customers and our observations together and try to try to tease out what's really happening here. And then the second thing is, uh, you know, Michael, I have to imagine, I've never been a student, but I have to imagine he's a tough professor <laughs> because uh, he's a tough research partner and, and, and the level of work that uh, we did together, you know, quite frankly, was at a level that uh, probably would have far surpassed anything I would have done by myself simply because uh, his standards are so high and, uh, you know, and his, uh, his editorial qualities, you know, he doesn't accept any statement that you can't back up with half a dozen proof points and so forth. So, really, it was a fantastic collaboration. I think we, we both uh, made each other a lot stronger. Jim, you seem to have gotten over all the hard parts, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> so, can you summarize some of the key findings that, you, that came out of your research to date? Well, that's a, that's a hard thing to summarize, but uh, let me sort of, the, the basic framework that we start with here is that uh, Information technology is something that emerged, you know, 30, 40 years ago and has started to permeate its way through businesses and through competition. Um, and we see that in three fundamental phases. The first phase was really the automation of the value chain. Uh, the use of information technology to automate order processing and, and collecting the books and keeping the books and, and, and CAD. I mean, CAD was one of the early value chain automation tools that allowed us to do uh, product development, product design in a different way. I mean, before uh, this whole era, we had mechanical products and manual paper processes, and the first generation of IT was to start to automate the internal processes of, of the company throughout the value chain. Stage two was the internet's emergence, which allowed us then to, uh, what we would say, integrate the value chain connect the various functions and activities in the firm into supply chain management, customer relationship management, areas like that where we took advantage of connectivity, uh, glo global manufacturing structures and things like that. But all that was still internal. That was still really how we did business, how we operated internally. Uh, in that process, we uh, digital became more and more important. We had a lot of data that we never had before. Uh, we could create digital products that we could never do before. But all of that was primarily internal. Uh, but what's interesting about this chapter that we are now in the beginning of is that now it's crossed the line from internal to the actual physical product itself. Um, and what's happened now is the information technology has embedded itself in the actual product. And that, of course, is dramatically changing the opportunity for products, functionality, what they can do. Uh, but it's also having the next impact on inside the company because the, the things you need to do to design products like this and market them and, uh, and service them are, are very, very different. So we're finding both the product is changing, the competition in the marketplace is changing, but also the internal operations are changing. Uh, that's kind of the high-level story that we found. And, and what we've been trying to do is develop the deep understanding of, of, of all the pieces of that uh, in, in, in this body of work. So your, your research has been predominantly on manufacturing companies. Are there yep. other sectors, other companies, products, industries you might yes, point to? Yes, uh, absolutely. Although, I mean, overall, manufacturing is still in the relatively early stage here. There's very few companies whose whole product line 
is smart connected, as we call it. By the way, I, I need to say this just for the record. We think the Internet of Things is not the right label here. Uh, the Internet is not the big news here. The Internet is old news. The Internet is a commodity. What's the big news is the changes in the actual product and what a product means and, 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 and what it can do. Um, and what we're seeing is that these new kinds of products are obviously uh, changing manufacturing industries. Um, we'll talk about that more. But they're also actually starting to embed themselves in services industries and change services. So, uh, so if you think about a service value chain, a service company has a value chain too, what's happening is these smart connected products are becoming embedded in the service company value chain and allowing the service company to, again, optimize and produce uh, value in, in very different ways. A great example would be an airline. This is just now happening. Most of us probably think the airline is connected to the ground and the pilots can talk to the ground, and, and that's true. They literally can talk to the ground. But historically, the bandwidth, the ability to connect the plane to the ground has been very limited. There's almost no capacity to move data from air to ground. That's now changing. And so we're starting to finally have a connected airplane. And once we have a connected airplane, we can absolutely change almost everything about being an airline in terms of maintenance, in terms of uh, flight operations, optimizing the flight path, uh, managing the cargo uh, and the baggage, and, and even the onboard service itself. So what we're going to see over the next uh, you know, uh, 5 to 10 to 20 years, because that industry is very conservative, very risk averse, we're going to see a really transformation in a service industry uh, because of smart connected products. And uh, you know, I could give you many other examples. Healthcare is in the process of that transformation. You know, even even gardening is is changing. Uh, we can now have sensors in the ground to sense the 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 water. We can take pictures, continuous pictures of the lawn to see what's wrong with it, to diagnose of, of flaws, to decide whether it needs fertilizing. We can hook all that into the irrigation system. Uh, uh, so, so virtually every service business is also going to be potentially affected, and uh, that's, that's, that's behind the trajectory in manufacturing, but it's starting to accelerate. Maybe Jim? I could add, uh, you know, at a fundamental level, if you think about smart connected products, the, uh, the technology we're talking about here affects the company that makes the products, and maybe they also sell and service the products, so it definitely affects the selling and the servicing of such products but it also, for the customer, affects the operation of such products. And so uh, for a Boeing or an Airbus, it affects the nature of airplanes, but for an airline, it affects the way you run an airline if you had smart airplanes. So one of the things that's interesting is that most manufacturing companies uh, are a bit like an airline, because while they're making widgets, they're frequently using tremendous amounts of automation equipment they buy from other people and use in their factories. So when they look at their factory, that's a bit like an airline, where you're now saying, well, how could I run this factory differently, even though not much of the equipment in the factory do I make, but I'd like to figure out how to connect it all together. And just like an airline wants to run a much more efficient transportation uh, system, I want to run a much more efficient factory for producing the widgets that I sell and service. So I think even, uh, even manufacturing companies are, are both operators of somebody else's equipment and uh, creators and servicers of their own. So they're, they're actually afoot in both camps. And I, I get, jump in here, and I think that my role on this board is to be a bit of the punching bag <laughs> of the IoT, because iRobot uh, has jumped in with both feet to try to embrace and, and tackle some of the, or take advantage of the, the uh, benefits of being a connected product. But the scope and scale of the impact on the organization uh, is immense. and it, it virtually touches every area of the business. And so it's not just that our robots are connected. It's the factories are sending us information streams. The, the sales organization is sending information streams. The products are sending information streams. Who is managing it? And how can you uh, take organizations which are not used to these inter information streams and try to harvest the theoretical value that is the promise. 
Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think we're, we're uh, learning that um, there's not a logical singular owner of all of these data streams, uh, regardless of how much we wish we could simplify it and make that so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, uh, of the two articles that we've uh, published so far, one was about the outside. It's about competition. And, and, and we can talk more about how this is reshaping competition. But just to pick up on your point, uh, the second article was about the inside. Um, and, and just like uh, we, we just heard, uh, these kind of products change everything about marketing, sales, manufacturing, um, you know, uh, after sales service, uh, procurement, you know, virtually everything. And, and the organization structure that we've all gotten used to, where you have a clear division between marketing and sales and manufacturing and IT and R&D, is blurring. And so we're seeing a new organizational form created to manage this integration uh, across the value chain, um, which is really the first time that we've had a major organizational change like this probably in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and a lot of tr traditional manufacturing companies are particularly having difficulty uh, dealing with it. Another way to think about it, which Jim often talks about, is you've had a traditional industrial company and there's, there's been a structure for that. We've had software companies and there's been a structure for that, sort of IT-based companies. Now what we're doing is we're putting the industrial company and the IT or software company together but that doesn't mean you go from one, one extreme to the other. It means you've got to do both at the same time. And uh, that's a, a very, very interesting and challenging problem. It's really, really early. We, we see very few companies now that have sort of settled into a structure. We're still seeing a lot of experiments in this area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so Jim, you know, Michael mentions you have two articles out already. Yep. I understand there's more research collaboration ongoing right now. Yep. Can you share some of the topics or maybe give us a preview of, of what you're finding in the yet to be uh, released version? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Michael and I, uh, along with our teams, came to an observation where we said uh, the Internet of Things uh, seems to be about the convergence of physical and digital. Uh, I talked a lot about that in my keynotes yesterday. But somehow we missed the human element. We left the people kind of out of it. And, uh, and then we became very intrigued, as you all know, with uh, ideas like augmented and virtual reality to allow the human to be converged with the physical and digital at the same time, to allow the human to interact with a product that was part physical and part digital in one way that was part physical and part digital. You know, that's really what augmented reality is. So, uh, you know, we got intrigued by this. And of course, you know, in parallel, I was making some acquisitions and, uh, and, and spent a lot of money on technology and talking to a lot of customers. So we really uh, got excited, quite frankly, by the reaction that people, uh, people give us when they see, for example, the demonstrations we did in our keynotes yesterday. It's incredible. So we said we should dig into this and, uh, and try to understand if you extrapolate forward from what's happening in the industry and what's happening with this technology. And I'm including, you know, what Microsoft is doing with the HoloLens and, and uh, Magic Leap and Oculus, you know, from uh, Google and Facebook. And if you extrapolate forward, you, there's a big wave headed our way. You know, it's coming on like a freight train. And, uh, and so we said, like, why? Why is everybody magnetically driven to this? How will they use it? And, uh, and we did a lot of research, and it's amazing. I mean, we think that augmented virtual reality is going to affect the type of products you make. You're going to stop putting computer screens in your product. They're, they're redundant and useless. Um, they're, going to, uh, they're going to affect the way you service things. You've seen all kinds of examples of that here. They're going to affect the way you uh, sell and market things. Uh, you saw Terry Lewis from Caterpillar can spread a whole configuration of uh, holograms up on the stage for people to look at. Uh, so there's some really big changes that are going to happen, again, in almost every part of the value chain. So we're uh, we're digging into that. We're, we, we have such exciting, unbelievable findings. And you know, we've reached out, as we did last time, to many of our customers. Again, you know, dozens and dozens, uh, probably approaching 100 customers now to collect ideas and, and get people's reaction to our ideas. And there's something coming together here that I think is pretty special, because uh, this concept of augmented virtual reality has sort of been in the world of games and toys. 
but it's coming like a freight train into the enterprise. And uh, we're going to help, hopefully with this article, decode all that and help executives understand why this is something they better uh, pay attention to because it's going to be very impactful to their business. Thanks, you yeah, It's quite literally coming to the freight train, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let's take a, a closer look at sort of the impact of IoT within the organization. Uh, Michael and Jim, um, you know, which functions in the organization will be most impacted by smart connected products and, and which have the most to gain? Well, let's let Jim start with product design because that's where PTC really, that's where the roots were of the company. So Jim, yeah. why don't you take that one and I'll take some of the others. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of things happening in uh, product design or engineering, whatever. Uh, the first thing is we're now engineering a product that has so much digital content and the, and the need for digital talent has kind of outrun the boundaries of the uh, capabilities of a typical engineering group. You know, a typical engineering group knows mechanical and electronics and maybe embedded software, but they don't really know cloud architectures and failover and, and uh, security and, and all those types of problems that uh, you get into when building a smart connected product. So uh, we're sort of finding that you know, that's where IT needs to step in. But the relationship between IT and engineering is a strange one, sometimes not even a healthy one. <laughs> and now we need them to both get on the same team and act like one organization, each building half of the product. And it's all got to come together and work just right or we can't ship the widget at the end of the day. So, I don't know, I'm sure, Colin, that's been a huge uh, challenge for you. Yeah, well, the... the um one of the interesting things as we started launching connected products is that part of the organization that really didn't have as much of a voice as you would like suddenly comes through loud and clear, and that's our customers. So our customers are actually in real time telling us how to build the products based on our real time ability to understand how they're being used. Roomba will tell how often it's being used, it will, it will talk about what type of floors it's on, it'll talk about the, the, the size of the room that it's uh, cleaned already, and that's just the beginning. And that information is being flowed back into our engineering organizations in real time. Yeah. And no more focus groups. No, to sit around and, and guess what the customers uh, no, might I mean, want. No, yeah, I mean, yeah. our robots are telling us yeah. immediately, and so that, yeah. you know, if you can, you can look at utilization as a surrogate for customer satisfaction. Yep. And so that if you did this, are people using your product more or less? Yep. Uh, if the robot doesn't make it back and dock, we know every time it doesn't make it back. And engineers love to solve problems, but they're also skeptical of focus groups. But when the robot says, I worked or I didn't work, it's incredibly compelling and, and, and it's just incredibly motivating and it says, okay, we now have a new member of our design team. It's the robot yeah, and, yeah, and the customer's voice yeah. that it represents. Well, so yeah, and then, and then that robot is an is a evergreen living type of product. So if it doesn't work quite the way you want, you get another shot at it perhaps. Right, I mean, you, you know, as soon as you enable over-the-air updates, uh, you know, I, the, um, uh, you can respond in real time because as a manufacturer, there's kind of a natural time constant of making a physical product. There's a, a faster time constant around making electrical engineering uh, circuits. And then there's software. So you go years to months to days or minutes, uh, depending on how, how well you're operating. And so that the robot industry goes, I can touch my product once a year, once every two years, to I can do something tomorrow if someone paste, posted something on Facebook or, twe or tweeted about it that we grabbed onto and said, oh wait, we have to address this, we can have a, something out immediately. So it yeah. changes the pace. Yeah. 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 So, I, so I think, it, it, you know, just to summarize, for engineering, you're talking about moving to fairly complex physical digital systems. Uh, you're talking about evergreen products. You're talking about constant feedback loops, which sort of ch challenge the traditional uh, requirements driven waterfall type of process. I mean, it really is a different engineering uh, process after the, uh, the transition to smart connected products. Yeah, well, let me pick up on that and just uh, segue into the, the whole issue of data. Uh, who, who collects the data? Who manages the data? Uh, who, who decides what, what data collect? Who, who decides how to deploy information and data? And of course, what, what smart connected products do is they generate this treasure trove of the most relevant data 
that you would ever want to have, which is what's happening to this product? Is it working? Is it on? Is it off? Is it failing? How is it failing? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and you can take that product data, which is this new rich resource, and combine it with a lot of data companies have already had, like their CRM data, who owns it, what do we know about them, uh, and various other external data sources. So, you know, what's the weather in this microclimate where this product has been operating, or uh, uh, what, you know, what, you know, all, all kinds of other attributes of uh, of, of things that you might want to know and, and, and then match with the product data to kind of see what's really going on. And the question is, you know, how do, how do you collect this stuff? How do you manage that? We're seeing a lot of companies create a, really a chief data officer. This is a new C-level job in this new world. Um, and we're starting to find out, the, the preference seems to be to kind of have one group really steward that data and, and manage it and make sure that it's stored properly and accessed, and then be the interface with all the functions that are going to be drawing on that data for design or for service or for other functions. So the data becomes, um, you know, traditionally, you know, the marketing people had their marketing information and the manufacturing people had their manufacturing information, but all that, all that blurs in this new world. So there's another function, and I'm sure, yeah. Colin, you're struggling with that. Well, it's, it is interesting because Logically, at least as iRobot is organized, the collector and manager of data is IT. So they run our, our database, they run our servers, and so that suddenly we have these streams of data coming in from the factories, coming in from our products. Who is most able to go and, and manage and collect that data responsibly? Where is the skill set with the organization? Well, that's IT. But then IT has traditionally been fairly divorced from product. And the idea of a chief data officer was very interesting to us. We haven't gone that step. What we've ended up doing is put product IT as a new competency within IT. Oh, interesting. And mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, when I think about how we've solved similar problems, you, the uh, iRobot has um, brought together mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and software engineering um, in a way that was unusually integrated in order to build robots because we're, we're so integrated. And, and we did that by creating product teams. And so that suddenly, IT is now part of our product teams. And so that we've um, diffused the knowledge of IT through a uh, sort of a culturally existing mechanism within iRobot around multifunctional teams getting together to go solve product problems. Mm -hmm. And I would tell you that that's, it's, it's working. It, I'm not sure if it's optimal, uh, and it does seem like we're succeeding on the backs of uh, good behavior uh, rather than brilliant structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, just to pick up on that, what we're seeing right now is a, a period of a lot of transitional structures, a lot of experimentation, um, and, uh, and in some cases we're starting to see new organizational units pop up. So, uh, you know, a, a good example of that would be, you know, a customer success organization. So if we go back to how is the organization changing internally, if we look at sales and marketing, you know, the traditional, you know, kind of sales and marketing organization is built around, you know, getting a sale. And, you know, you go out and make sales calls and you try to get people interested and, and, and then the job of the salesperson is to make a sales call and sell the product and get the order and then you ship it and then we're done. And then we may go talk and see if they're happy occasionally and just be nice, you know, but basically that's it. But in this world, shipping the product doesn't mean that you lose your connection to the product. You, you know everything about what's happening to that product. You can tell whether the customer is using it in a dumb way or a smart way. Uh, you can tell whether the customer is getting the value that you wanted to deliver or not. Um, you, can, you can understand a lot of things about uh, that 
ongoing uh, relationship. And, and all of a sudden, we need to change marketing into managing that ongoing customer relationship. We have to take responsibility for helping the customer get the value. And what we're also seeing is, is a, a lot of companies are starting to move at different speeds at really product as a service. So with, with, with this new data and these new kinds of products, it becomes very, very feasible to sell almost anything as a service. Uh, because then you can really take responsibility for the operation because you have visibility on that operation. Uh, but once you're selling product as a service, what you, you, you obviously want to get renewals. You, know, you want people to keep signing up. And in order to do that, the product can't be sitting around half the day so that they already have all the capacity they need, uh, or, and, and you've got to help them succeed. So we have these customer success organizations which are really dedicated to learning about whether the customer is succeeding with your product, and if not, what we can do to help them, and we're taking responsibility for that. So this is a radical change in this function that's been stable, again, for 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah, so, so you've uh, touched on a few of the, the new types of organizational structures. What about um, you know, just collaboration and how all these different things play together? Do you, know, you want to speak a little to that? Jim, do you want yeah, to take yeah. that? Yeah, uh, so I mentioned already the need, and, and Colin reinforced the need for uh, engineering and IT to find a new collaboration model around product development. Um, a second example is this customer success group because that's part sales and marketing, but it's part customer service still. It's a, it's a new organization. Um, created around a new source of data. You know, Colin mentioned that utilization is a proxy for uh, customer satisfaction. Well, whose job is it to watch utilization? Because that's not really engineering's job, uh, it's not a problem, so the service, the helpline might say, it's not my job, you know, sales and marketing never did that before, so, so that's a place where we actually need some collaboration. A, a, a third area, um, which we've seen a lot of, is what we call D DevOps or, or development slash operations. It's, a, it's actually a, contra a contraction of those two words. Very common again in software environments where you can change running software. So for example, if you use uh, salesforce.com CRM system, they change that system all the time in small, careful ways. So it's a living system. Each time you log into it, it might be a little bit different than it was last time. But uh, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, special challenge to introduce changes into products that are already deployed and running in the field. You know, uh, Colin mentioned push software updates down over the air. Well, you've got to be careful doing that because if you push a bug down over the air or the, or the software update doesn't install quite right, you know, in an effort to make a product better, you could take it out of commission and, and then your customer's really mad. So development operations is how does engineering take changes they wish they could make in the product and move through a careful process of uh, verifying the quality and the installation process and then releasing that change sort of into the, into the uh, portfolio of deployed products either all at once or in some uh, carefully planned way. So that's another place where it's part engineering, it's, it's actually part like almost manufacturing because uh, you're actually changing the nature of the product that, that was manufactured. So again, engineering can't just make changes anytime they want. We, we have to collaborate and, uh, and try to figure out what's the best way to do that. And then the final, uh, just if I could, yep. the final example we wrote about in our papers was this, uh, this uh, data function, the so-called chief data officer or the unified data organization. Because again, uh, IT can collect the data, but whose job is it to figure out what is this data telling engineering? What is it telling manufacturing about manufacturing quality? What is it telling... Uh, sales and marketing, you know, what is it telling DevOps and customer success? So, so how do we all get a cross-functional team working on that so the data isn't just piling up? In fact, I'll tell you, many of the earliest uh, examples of smart connected product just produced warehouses of data that nobody ever looked at. Uh, you know, it's often said that less than 1% of the data collected from smart connected products across all companies is ever even looked at. Well, why is that? It's because they haven't figured out you know, whose job is it to, to, to run the refinery that processes all this crude data coming in from the edge and, and produce all these beneficial byproducts for the, for the different part of the company? Mm -hmm. the, uh, I wanted to comment on, you know, we, we, we t uh, as these changes roll out, I talked a little bit about how 
uh, IT at iRobot has increased its mission from just being company IP, corporate IP to product IT, and then uh, through an educational process, I've created uh, users who are trying to put demands on IT to get that data out, so that there's people know that they're supposed to get it. The other area of the company that has been radically shifted by our move into uh, the IoT, you know, more data coming in, is customer service. And you both mentioned it, and I thought I would try to give a, a, a practical example of something that is a more transactional, um, uh, traditional process that through better connectivity becomes, uh, you know, it's almost merged with sales and marketing. Every time you have an interaction with a customer, you know enough about them to have an opportunity to positively impact their opinion of, about iRobot. You could potentially sell them an upgrade, so it's in a marketing opportunity, as, as well as a, uh, a way of better servicing their needs, because frankly, uh, we get more, if you call iRobot with a problem about your robot, from your robot than we get from you now. The, uh, the, custom, the, the robot will tell us what's wrong with it, and so that we can immediately engage you in a very satisfying and quick process. And so that, uh, again, you, you, I think uh, you talk correctly about how, okay, this data stuff changes everything. My, my customer service model is now marketing. My, you know, IT is now product. And, you know, you know I made the comment around challenging the organization to uh, act flatter uh, as at least the interim uh, mechanism for dealing with and uh, trying to take advantage mm -hmm. uh, because I think that the new structures take a lot of time to emerge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you think about the fundamental principles of organizational design, uh, the, the kind of the core theory says that different things going on within the organization that are differentiated or different need to be separated into the groups that can focus on those functions. But then, of course, we always have to integrate, connect across the differentiated functions and to integrate into a whole organizational you know, strategy and, 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 and operating practices. What's happened with this new uh, I, uh, smart connected products is that the balance between differentiation and integration has dramatically changed. In the direction of the integration now needs to be ongoing, routine, every day. You can't just have handoffs between manufacturing and you know, sales and service. Uh, it's not a handoff. It's, it's an ongoing, integrated, collaborative process. And so the flatness here is, is a great metaphor for what's really going on. And, and, and it's this different balance between, you know, how much can you let each group do their own thing versus how those groups have to integrate. It's that different balance that is causing this organizational complexity, uh, which, uh, quite frankly, Jim and I, when we first started working on this, I mean, I don't think we had this appreciation for just how big a deal the organizational issues were uh, as opposed to the technical issues or the conceptual issues about competition. Yeah, well, well, Jim and Colin, you guys are on the front lines of this. Um, it's such an important shifting dynamic within the company. Are there any other best practices you want to highlight before I move on? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, if, if you watch uh, how software companies work and, and compare that to how industrial companies work, it's vastly different. And so um, we, we're going to end up with some of both, but I think there's an opportunity here for the industrial company to actually embrace some pretty good practices from the software uh, industry and from the digital part of the uh, of the company going forward, you know, one example we talked a little bit about at our conference yesterday was uh, agile processes. You know, in the uh, industrial world, we do changes in big batches. You know, we we work for for three, four years to come out with the new model year, uh, the new version of this automobile or this piece of equipment or whatever, and it's a whole batch of changes coming out at once but with long periods of time in between. And that's exactly the opposite of how the uh, software industry works. Because the software industry has adopted an agile process. And they say, don't even tell me what the requirements are, because you'll probably spend forever trying to write down the requirements and you'll be wrong anyway. 
you know, I'll work on your requirements for six months, I'll show it to the, to, to the customer, and they'll say, that's not what I meant. And then all that work is wasted. So in the software industry, there's this much more agile methodology of uh, try something, show it to the customer, okay, work on it a little bit more, show it to the customer, and so forth. So I think this, this agile idea is a, is a big, big idea. Um, you know, there's other big ideas. Uh, customer analytics. I mean, Colin kind of already mentioned this again in the idea of uh, you get this incredible source of data. You know, Google knows everything about what you do. And they've built a whole business around selling that information to other people, to advertisers and so forth. What well, turns out, Colin knows a lot about when you vacuum your floors, too. And, and that's, that's pretty useful, not only to make better robots, but you can get creative and think of a lot of different ways to do it. And then the final thing I'd say again is this customer success. You know, if you have all this data and you don't use it, shame on you. Because uh, you really had an opportunity to redefine the relationship with your customer. And now you have the means to know the state of the relationship. You can't wait for them to call because, for example, low utilization is not a service problem. It's a product problem or a customer relationship problem or maybe it's just a training problem. I don't know. But uh, you know, we need an organization to get very proactive about saying, OK, we have this data, and we're running analytics against it. How do I now change the relationship with the customer into a proactive one? You know, just a, a, a quick little uh, you know, sidebar on that. I, sometimes I draw a triangle on the whiteboard, and I say, uh, here's you, your company. Here's your product, and uh, here's your customer. And it used to be your customer had to call you to tell you about your product. And of course, they only call you when they're angry and when there's a problem. Uh, and your low utilization actually doesn't make them angry. They're just frustrated. And that usually doesn't warrant a call. Um, so in that case, the, the person, the customer, was the sensor on your product. Well, we should turn that around. And we should say, wait a minute. The product should be a sensor on the customer. I should use the product to tell me about my relationship with the customer. And if that early warning system is starting to show a problem, like low utilization, I should intervene and fix that problem before the whole thing blows up and the customer buys a different product from somebody else. So that's kind of an example of uh, you know, a, a software practice where you absolutely use the product as a sensor on the customer could be adopted by a lot of industrial or, or particularly digital industrial companies you know, for similar benefit. The, um I'll make two points. I think that uh, I'm, I'm definitely on the Agile bandwagon, and certainly uh, we try to take the uh, religion of Agile beyond the software space and start applying it to mechanical and electrical um, uh, product development as well. So one of the areas that iRobot is, is deeply engaged in is the concept that how minimal a prototype can you put in front of the customer and get valuable feedback from? Because oftentimes, you know, engineers always want it to be perfect, marketers always want it to look perfect, and yet a 20% prototype can often get 80 or 90% of the value from the customer and takes a tiny percentage of, of the time. So that uh, test early, test often, but also uh, organizationally we're trying to embrace uh, an exploration of what is the minimum viable prototype. Maybe it's a picture, maybe it's a, an animation because with the types of tools we have now for 3D yeah. CAD, we can make an animation of a yeah. concept yeah. like this and, and get feedback. And augment it into your living room, by the way. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And the second point is that there is a natural cadence, as I mentioned before, of software and hardware development. And whenever we look at our development cycles, we try to ask ourselves, how do we avoid getting caught in the trap of the lowest common denominator cycle for innovation? Uh, so that the, the idea that if I'm, my mechanical is just going to take this long, but my software is going to take this long, how do I create a rich uh, library of hardware surrogates such that my software people are not slowed down. And when we find ourselves in a situation where something's moving at the kind time cost of something else, we say, okay, that, that's wrong, stop, we need change. So wow, 
There's a lot of change here that's very complex. Michael, do you want to weigh in on sort of how we get from here to there? Well, be before we do that, I think we need to spend a little bit of time on the outside um, and uh, a little bit of time on, you know, my favorite subject, which is strategy. Um, and I just want, I think, I think it's worth noting a couple of other major uh, points here that I think by and large pretty much every industry is, is affected by. Um, and, and one of the things we found fascinating was that these products in addition to all the internal changes, are raising a question that companies historically don't have to think very much about, which is, what business are we actually in? And um, you know, one of the you know one of the examples we like to use is John Deere, uh, who makes farm tractors, and they're all very green. You know, we we all have seen that color. Um, and, you know, for a long, long time, John Deere had a really easy answer to the question of what business we're in. We're in the tractor business. Or then maybe they got into combine, so now we're also in the combine business. Um, and, uh, and, and so on. But what we're finding here is that with the different nature of smart connected products and their ability to monitor and control and integrate and connect, all of a sudden the boundaries of industries generally broaden. We're no longer in the farm tractor industry when we can actually connect and integrate the tractor, the harvester, the tiller, the irrigation system, where we can make all those things work as a system. And that's happening within buildings, that's happening within the home, that's happening in the garden, that's happening on the airplane. Uh, that's happening in lots of different businesses. In fact, virtually every business we see, the net effect of smart connected products is to broaden the industry boundaries, which, which causes you to ask the question, well, we've been making tractors, do we need to go beyond that? You know, John Deere has been struggling for a number of years of, you know, so how much do we have to control the other product categories within the farm uh, within the farm system in order to play. Can we, can, we just, can we just stay in the tractor business and and play well with all the other machines in terms of connecting and integrating, or do we really need to be in those other industries? And there's a lot of experimentation going on and frankly a lot of uncertainty about how to make that decision. And uh, you know, do we need to create a proprietary platform for the integrated home in order to ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, have a competitive advantage and an attractive position, or really can we just stay in making our piece of that integrated home and, you know, and connect, you know, with all the other players? And, uh, um, and, and I, think, I think the answer we're seeing more and more is that increasingly we have to be an active participant in the rest of the system, even if we don't own it. Uh, because ultimately the engineering, the product development, the product design, the kind of data we're collecting, all that is affected not just about by our product and how we optimize our product, but, but around the whole system. So that would be one of the major external changes. And uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's something, in, uh, Colin, you guys are contending with, but it'd be interesting to hear you talk about that. Sure. Uh, you know, as I was listening to you, I, I was nodding because suddenly the moment your product is connected, you're part of an ecosystem. And uh, in, your, in, the, in your industry, if there is an ecosystem uh, and you're not part of it, you're going to rapidly uh, become not competitive because the, the, um, the benefits of being able to uh, share data with other partners or with other elements uh, almost inevitably leads to a competitive advantage. And so that in the uh, home product uh, realm, or the consumer internet of things, um, we're very rapidly going to see huge pressure for many, many things to become connected to be able to uh, take part in the value that, that being a member of the ecosystem uh, gives and grants the world. And so then, it creates the entire competitive, it changes the competitive landscape because what is your right to occupy what part of the ecosystem? And so you can be the, the greatest 
you know, pear peeler manufacturer in the world, but if suddenly you have to be part of the ecosystem, okay, maybe you're, you got that. But then you try to overreach and say, well, I'm going to own a larger part of that ecosystem where my core competency is in Paris peeling, but uh, I'm going to go hire lots of people. And companies can forget that there are other companies out there that occupy places in the ecosystem that have, it's what they do. And so what we're trying to understand for iRobot is what is our core competency. We know we have to be part of the ecosystem. We have to be world class in connecting to that ecosystem. Now, having done that, what are the fences? Yep. What is the moat that we're going to create to allow us to be sustainably best in the world mm -hmm. within that domain, which is a very different uh, question than we had to wrestle with just a few years ago? Yep. Yeah, it's a great question, and, and I think one of the interesting things that, and, and I think you know, we're still learning on this, but I think you know, if essentially the fundamental design of this part of the system and this part of the system have to be adjusted to optimize for each other, then we think actually, you know, controlling both of those is important because it's very hard to coordinate technical design and architecture with a, a separate company that, you know, has their own interest. On the other hand, if it's really mostly about the data and optimizing the data and sharing the data and, and making sure that that is a kind of a seamless process and that learning how to use the data from the other parts of the ecosystem in your, in your piece, then I think properly we can coexist and, and have sort of a, of a collaborative sort of quasi-alliance model. So uh, this is a, uh, again, what we find in, in the world of smart connected products is that, you know, and industry boundary shifts are just one of them, but what happens is that we're now confronted with some more strategy questions that we never had before. Yep. Uh, you know, John Deere never had to think about, well, should, should we get into the combine business? I mean, they could have thought about it, but it had been sort of related diversification. It wouldn't have been basically being in a highly integrated product area that we have to kind of merge with our traditional business. Um, so this, this issue of scope, you know, where do we play in the system? Uh, lots of other questions. Uh, you know, what of all this data do we really collect? I mean, is it really worth piling up, you know, 24-7 data out of 17,000 sensors in a mining machine? You know, what do we do with all that? Uh, and, then, and then the question is, how, who's going to look at it? So there's a whole set of additional uh, strategy questions. Another critical question in this space, which I think we all have to really deeply be sensitive to, is the question of, all of a sudden, we have an explosion of functionality that we can add to the product. You know, all kinds of user interface options, all kinds of function options, feature options. Um, what of all that should we actually do? Uh, which, what of it is valuable to the customer? Uh, one, of, one of my favorite stories here, because it's a very vivid story, is um, there's a company called A.O. Smith. You, you probably have heard of A.O. Smith. You probably you have a good chance you own an A.O. Smith product. Good, good it's, chance they're in the audience. Yeah, it, it's, in your, it's in your basement, and it's a water heater, okay? And, you know, in modern life, you know, we really like water heaters, you know, because we don't, we like a warm shower. We like hot water, you know, to wash our hands and the other things we need hot water for. Um, so a water heater is kind of a core product in every, most every home, and, you know, A.O. Smith, you know, once this smart connected product thing started happening, they could actually instrument and censor their water heaters so that they can tell you when it's failing before it fails. Okay, and I think we've all, many of us have had the experience of our water heater failing. It's not fun. You know, you turn on the shower and it's cold. Uh, and, um, you know, that's, that's kind of not a fun event. And, and so A.O. Smith says, you know, first thinking is, well, let's instrument that and let's sell that as, as you know, part of a water heater. And you'll have an, you, you'll have an app and you can, you can just check in and see whether your water meter is going to fail or it'll send you an alarm or a warning to tell you, you know, 
the clock is ticking, you know, this is probably going to fail within the next two weeks. Uh, what they discovered was that the customer actually wasn't interested in that. And, you know, if it was free, it was okay, but, you know, paying extra? Um, no, no, thank you. Why? Because the average water, water meter lasts for 13 years. And there's, not a, there's a good chance that you won't own the house, you know, after when it fails. And do you really need to know? And most customers say, I, you know, it, that's too complicated for me. I, I, I'm not going to pay for that, okay? So the question is, we can add functionality. It seems important. Is your water heater going to fail? But yet, actually, if you think about the customer and how they think about it, no value creation that they're willing to pay for. Now, if we take the same product, a water heater, and go into a hotel and ask the hotel owner, uh, would you like to know if your water heater is going to fail before it fails so that your, these 72 guest rooms are not going to have hot water? You know what that hotel water owner says? Sign me up. I want to know every day. I, I want an update because that is core to my business. That creates tremendous important value for my business and it creates tremendous problems if that fails. So you can see that you've got to be very careful about what functions to embody, what to give away, what to make part of the price, what to make optional. And companies are struggling with too many choices too many things you can do, uh, and, um, uh, and that's going to be uh, something we're grappling with for a long time because we're learning very rapidly about all these cool new things we can do uh, in the service function, in the uh, you know, customization, and tailoring, and, and, and just the basic uh, uh, characteristics of the product. So Jim, I know, and both you guys have probably uh, been struggling with that, I, I, think, I think it's a great topic for everybody here to think about because just because you can do something doesn't mean it creates value for the customer that they're willing to pay for. And if it doesn't, it's just going to raise your cost, but not your revenue, you know? And that's, that's a recipe for lower margins. So d d we got to be very careful here because a lot of the cost of smart connected products are fixed cost. We've got to design this software. We've got to create this app. And um, a fixed cost then um, is, you know, got to be spread over, you know, a fair number of products and you've got to get revenue to pay for that fixed cost. But, but the mindset often is, well, let's do this and then, then companies get into this situation where they're not getting enough new revenue and therefore uh, they start actually having the pressure to discount because they've got all this fixed cost and now the incremental cost, the variable cost is lower and therefore they say, well, incrementally, I'm better off if I discount a little bit. So we have a complicated value pricing product development dynamic here. Jim, you want to so, comment or Colin? Well, well so we're, we're just down to the last couple of minutes. So I was hoping yep. to, to maybe pose a question, but also run down the line and give you each uh, a last few moments to summarize any points okay. you haven't made. Um, but, but I really wanted to get to the conversation of talent. And how is this sort of changing? You know, the, you know, what, what are the needs? How are we going to, we can't supply today's uh, talent that we need in the tech industry. What does this do for it? And, and so you can take that, or if there's a point you wanted to make, but we have about two minutes left. So if you want to, maybe Colin, run down the line. Sure. Uh, on the talent side, I would say that the, uh, the IoT pushes technology into the organization in ways that challenges the status quo. And a company's ability to take advantage of that uh, going back to a point earlier made is, is step one, act flat. And so what type of, of talent, uh, I think it affects the type of people organizations hire where more than ever an employee's willingness to work in teams and collaborate is crucial to the type of interdisciplinary uh, co-working and invention uh, that a company is going to need. So the, the, the siloed, great individual performer has gone down in value relative to the collaborative uh, contributor. And uh, I think that that's something that uh, is important for 
manufacturing companies, all tech companies to consider as they're hiring, and those individuals that can do it well are going to become increasingly coveted in this brave new world. Yeah, and Jim, I know we, yeah. sometimes we talk about um, high skill, low skill, they're, you know, AR thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I guess I'd like to just make the summary point based on the research we've done and are doing that uh, Back when I was evangelizing our traditional business of CAD and PLM, I met a lot of engineering executives, manufacturing executives, uh, service executives. But when the topic switched to smart connected products and the Internet of Things, I started meeting CEOs. And, and I've met, my Rolodex is just blown up with uh, CEO business cards in the last few years because this is a CEO topic. Why? It affects the strategy of your company, it affects your products, it affects how you compete. It affects uh, how you position yourself in the market. It affects the nature of work that you do. Um, and then it affects your organization. I mean, it, it does. Colin made this point. It touches everything. And so I think, you know, our takeaway is that we are at a really interesting transitional moment in the industry here. And uh, we're working on something, I mean, we being all of us here, working on something that's big and really important. And uh, I think it, it, it's, it's, like I said in my uh, keynote yesterday, it's, uh, it's scary, um, it's exciting, and it's difficult in any case, but it's something we have to do. And so uh, smart connected products are great, and this whole AR, VR thing is just like pouring gasoline on it. It just speeds it up, makes it more interesting, more exciting, it's just a big catalyst. Do you want to pose the last question for me, well, or should I well, just so, go for so it? So actually, I, I, I did kind of, we're sort of out of time, but, but I wanted to actually ask you, really, when we look at, at leadership and excellence in IoT and this whole emerging new world globally and in the country, mm -hmm. you know, I'd love to get your perspectives on, you know, where is it emerging? You know, does you know, GE's headquarters coming here, is that a sign? You know, mm -hmm. What's your perspective yeah. on who's leading here? Well, I mean, I think that, that this has been bubbling up in, in many of the, let's call it the traditional technology hubs because there's so much, you know, software, IT, analytics stuff here. Um, but I think what's interesting about this is the, what Jim said earlier, the merging of industrial and IT and software. And um, I think that you can't just, the IT and the software alone uh, ultimately isn't the real secret sauce here. It's the ability to connect them with the physical, the industrial. And uh, I think that's why, um, you know, places like Silicon Valley, as much as we love Silicon Valley and admire Silicon Valley, they're mostly on the IT and the software and the technology and don't have a real industrial tradition uh, in terms of making kind of locomotives and, you know, manufactured goods. Uh, um, and what we're seeing is places actually like Boston which have both the long industrial tradition, this is where the industrial revolution, early stages of the industrial revolution in America was here. And we have, we have a lot of the roots of that still around, but also this area has developed the IT technology, data analytics, you know, product development, you know, software industry. Putting those two things together, I think, is making Boston one of the hotspots. That said, this is going to be a, a fascinating competition around, across geography, across the world. I think overall, I would say the U.S., this should be a competitive advantage for the U.S. This whole phenomena is taking advantage of a lot of the unique uh, assets and strengths we have in America that often other countries have less of. So hopefully this will give us a, a, a kick in the butt in terms of getting our economy and our innovation uh, pipeline moving more rapidly again, uh, which we, of course, badly need given the slow growth and, and inequality that we're seeing. So uh, we're optimistic uh, about this as being a growth engine, an innovation engine, um, and also something that can do a lot of good for the world because uh, these products with this data can save water, they can save energy, they can improve health, they can avoid waste, they can do a lot of things that are not just good for business but really good for society. So. Uh, we're very excited about this. We hope in whatever way you're participating, you'll view it with the same excitement, the same opportunity, the same sense of, uh, of, uh, of innovative uh, uh, potential, and, uh, uh, and we, we want to go along for the ride. We're going we're gonna to be hopefully watching very carefully what all of you do and, and, uh, and wishing you well. So with that, I'd like to thank our wonderful panel and thank you all for being here today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim.